pray with me? God, we believe, but help our unbelief. Shore us up where we're weak. Protect us where we're vulnerable. Grow our faith in thee. Bless this message you have placed upon my heart. And may it be received by us all. As we seek a deeper spiritual connection with you. As we seek a deeper connection with one another. As you continue to fuse us together as one body. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Let every heart and mind say amen. Let us put our hands together for the Lord here today. If you would please turn your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 11. 1 Kings chapter 11. As we continue our trek through the Old Testament. We are at 1 Kings chapter 11 from the NIV version. Hear these words. King Solomon, however, loved many foreign women besides Pharaoh's daughter. Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, and Hittites. They were from nations about which the Lord had told the Israelites, you must not intermarry with them. Because they will surely turn your hearts after, uh, after their gods. Nevertheless, boy, I hate when we read over that. Nevertheless, Solomon held fast to them in love. He had 700 wives of royal birth, 300 concubines, and his wives led him astray. Lord Jesus. As Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God, as the heart of David his father had been. He followed Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, Molech, the detestable god of the Ammonites. So Solomon did evil in the eyes of the Lord. He did not follow the Lord completely as David his father had done. On a hill east of Jerusalem, Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the detestable god of Moab, and for Molech, the detestable god of the Amorites. He did the same for all his foreign wives who burned incense and offered sacrifices to their gods. The Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from, God, from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice. Although he had forbidden Solomon to follow uh, other gods, Solomon did not keep the Lord's command. So the Lord says to Solomon, since this is your attitude, you have not kept my covenant, my decrees, which I commanded you. I will most certainly tear the kingdom away from you and give it to one of your subordinates. Nevertheless, for the sake of David, your father, I will not do it during your lifetime. I will, not, I will tear it out of the hand of your son. Yet, I will not tear the whole kingdom from him, but will give him one tribe for the sake of David, my servant, and for sake of Jerusalem, which I have chosen. You may be seated. Well, my sermon title this morning is Fool's Gold. Fool's gold. Many are somewhat familiar with this account of scripture. Yes, Solomon had hundreds of wives. And then the jokes begin. Once again, on the surface, many readers will hear and or read this passage of scripture. And their reaction of this account is simple. Don't have all these wives and it's going to be all right. As a matter of fact, I'm going to just circumvent this whole situation and I just won't get married at all. Problem solved. But as the infomercial trying to sell you something on late night television, but wait, there's more. And I say to you this morning before you have a chance to turn the channel or turn off the television, 
But wait, there is more here for you that may resonate in this account than you think for you in your own life, in your own situation, married or not. Amen and hallelujah. Just as we looked at our main character, David, for several weeks, now we look at our main character, Solomon. Let's get up to speed. Solomon asked for wisdom from the Lord to rule the people. He was given that and much more. Riches, fame, he had it all. He was also given the task of building the Lord's temple, the house of prayer for all nations. This building was to be a visual representation of God on earth. And when Solomon built this temple, no expense was spared. All of the best materials and, and metals out of this arose a magnificent structure that would remind people every time they saw it of how awesome God is and how, how great this God was who rescued his people from Egypt had chosen this people of Israel to be his nation, a nation that would bring light to the world, a nation that would influence the world, a nation that would transform the world because they were the people of God. It was a great time in the land. Now, appearances of the Lord didn't quite happen all of the time. But for Solomon... The Lord had appeared to him, not once, but twice. Now, this time to underscore the promise of faithful obedience to the Lord will mean that your family will have a king on the throne forever. Israel would be securely established for eternity Solomon was set to be the greatest king in Israel's history. He had favor and power and wealth and wisdom. But he had a couple of blind spots, a couple of weaknesses. Uh, these, these few weaknesses would be his undoing. One, like his father, his weakness was women. And two was this insatiable need to please others above God. And just like most issues that can become our undoing, it starts out small. And before we know it, we're in the middle of the forest with no breadcrumbs to show how did I get here? So Solomon married an Egyptian princess. It wasn't bad um, because she gave up worship of her idols and false gods and worshiped the true and living God. Side note, number one, all who are married, dating, thinking about being married, I'm I need to remind us that we are spiritual beings having a physical experience on this earth. And, and if we are not uh, on one accord spiritually, if we're not connected spiritually, if we're not serving the same God, if we're not heading in that same godly direction, then we may as well be enemies. Because, because being unequally yoked spiritually cannot be overcome by worldly things. If we ain't on one accord with God, money ain't going to solve that. Successful career ain't going to help that. Sex is not going to mend that. Children or any other distraction that we can come up with to try to make up for where we lack spiritually, it's not going to happen. If one person is pulling away from God and the other one is pulling towards God, both lives will be in turmoil. Back to Solomon. He had one wife. And he wanted another wife. Uh, then another wife. And then he thought, I should be like other kings. Boy, be careful for looking at that neighbor. Be careful. When you look at other countries, he's like, man, 
these other kings out here doing it and doing it big. And I'm Solomon. I got to do it big earth. So 700 wives, 300 concubines later, Houston, we have a problem. What was the problem? As wise as Solomon was, he came up with this bright idea that, that, that he could ensure and make peace with other nations by, by making alliances with them and marrying their daughters and taking on their concubines. You, you ever see someone who, who got more degrees behind their name than you can count? But, but they make some very dumb life decisions. I heard the term when I was growing up. They, they call this kind of person an educated fool. Listen, child of God. We cannot, on one hand, say, I am royalty. I am a child of the most high. God fights my battles. What God has for me is for me. And turn around and think that we have to compromise ourselves, compromise God's commands just to get ahead or make peace with an enemy or gain worldly favor. Listen, if for the transaction to take place, meaning for us to receive this promise, peace, promotion, or prosperity. If, if, if the transaction currency on our part is just sex, then we're buying fool's gold. And when we lose sight of what, what God has told us and commanded us, we think we can make a deal with the devil and give ourselves over to sin for gain. It's fool's gold. You see, because what's going to happen is that, that that promise is going to be revealed to be a lie. That peace in reality is going to be war. Listen, you're not going to wake up on the director's couch with the starring role. Listen, that sugar daddy will give you spiritual diabetes. Don't fall for the fool's gold. If we're going to believe God, then, then let's do that and not be educated fools. Solomon fell for the fool's gold. And he married all of these women. Some of them worshiped the true and living God, but many of them did not worship idol from their country and culture of origin. And Solomon, I'm guessing as I'm reading, is one of these uh, go along to get along people. Mm -hmm. Because he slowly began to compromise his faith. Why? Because he allowed them to continue to worship their idols. Now listen, when we surround ourselves with something that, that, that we purposely allow in our lives, it will influence us. And eventually we will become a full participant. Mm -hmm. We've talked consistently over the past 18 months in our journey through the Old Testament. And the reoccurring theme is disaster awaits us when we put pleasing something or someone else above pleasing God. So what did Solomon do? He turned a blind eye to their worship of other gods. I'm, I'm just going to act like that ain't happening. 
Y'all just go over there and do your, your little idol thing, and it's going to be all right in the kingdom. Hmm. <sighs> because by me allowing you all to do that, that's what's keeping our country safe. That's what's keeping the peace. Solomon first allowed it. And I'm sure there was a request from the wives like, well, since he allowed it, it's time to up the ante. We need more. Hmm. Solomon, go alone to get along. He says, okay. So now he provided them priest and ceremonial robes for their idol worship. Well, obviously, that wasn't enough because I've said this before. Idols don't fight for inclusion. They fight for dominance. So now, Solomon's all the way turned out. Because then he, he ordered, orchestrated the building of high places or, or temples for their worship of their false god. And soon after that, he became a full participant in the idol worship. Started from the bottom, now he's there. Yeah, okay. Side note, when we begin to financially sacrifice to an idol, then our heart is turned from God. It doesn't matter how much we come to church. It doesn't matter how well we can sing. It doesn't matter how we operate in ministry on our post every Sunday morning. When our monetary sacrifice to a lifestyle, a person, or an ideal is above our monetary sacrifice to God, our hearts are turned away from God. And that, my friends, is worse than bankruptcy, divorce, repossession, foreclosure, and termination. But look at this slow progression of Solomon. He first allowed it. Then he gave a little more. Then a little more until he was a full participant in this pagan idolatry. And for a minute, let me, I'll just give a side note. Where, where you think that this is some kind of benign situations. These particular idols that he built these high places to. One was, 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 was a humongous structure which had the belly hollowed out. And part of this ritualistic uh, ceremony was the sacrifice and burning of children. This was regular. So before you think this was just some light and other candles, no, this, it, it was full-blown idolatry, murder, sacrifice of God's creation. Um, don't think when you allow yourselves to be immersed in the lascivious behavior of family members and friends and social organizations you may belong to, don't think that you won't be negatively influenced by it. Too often, we, we want to act like, okay, well, God is placing me in this situation to test my faith. No, church. Listen to me. It is not a test of faith if God is not proctoring the exam. It is not a test of faith if God is not proctoring the exam. We want to, to, to throw ourselves in situations or allow situations to, 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 to be around us that God has already warned us about. 
And then turn around with the de declaration, God sure is testing me. No, no, and a resounding no. Church, don't play this game because we're going to lose every time. Let's look at the facts, that which we know. God knows us. God knows everything about us. So in knowing everything about us, what that means is God knows the limits of our faith. Every one of us has a limit to our faith, and God knows the limits. The enemy doesn't know it, but God does. Mm. That means he knows our breaking points. So since God knows this, and if God puts us, hear that? If God puts us in a situation, then God knows our faith is strong enough to overcome the situation or circumstance without compromising our faith in God, our walk in God. Just like when God is walking and he's having a conversation with Satan back in the book of Job. And we're able to talk about this issue. And God says, well, have you considered my servant Job? And Satan says, well, the only reason he faithful to you like that is because all this stuff you gave him. You take away that stuff, he'll curse you to your face. God says, okay, do whatever you want to do with him. You just can't kill him. So Job lost his family. He lost his riches. Friends forsook him. Wife said, you need to cuss God and die. And Job's response to that was he fell on the ground and worshiped God. Listen, church, <laughs> um, don't think God is going to be putting you in a Job faith test. And you're not even regular in church attendance. D don't think God is going to put a Job faith test on you and you don't tithe and, and you don't pray and you don't study and you're not serving. You're not. It's not a Job test for you. God is not testing with exams that he's not proctoring. God is not testing you by saying, go ahead and marry this person who is not a believer and we'll just work it out. Listen, if you're struggling with alcohol, God is not testing you with the VIP seating at your regular happy hour spot. It's not a Job test. If you're having a problem with, with sex, God is not testing you with internet pornography pop-ups. God is not testing you with strip club evangelism. If you're struggling with, with sex, God is not testing you with, it's after midnight and a text pops up, what you doing, smile face, winking emoji. If God is not proctoring the exam, then even a wise man like Solomon can be made to look like a fool. What and who we choose to surround ourselves with will influence us one way or the other. What we choose to allow ourselves to be immersed in will change us. And before long, we will be a full participant in it. This is how we work. And this is why the Hebrew writer was very specific 
in Hebrew 10 and 24. Hear these words. Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. It says, let us not give up meeting together as some have the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and encourage one another all the more as you see the day, capital D, approaching. See, the Hebrew writer is talking about believers coming together as a faith community to, 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 to worship, to work, and to fellowship with one another. Why, why is that? So that the faith community will then be the greatest influence in our life. That we may come totally immersed in, in ministry and become full participants in the life of the church. This is why church attendance is so crucial. This is why fellowship with the other saints, both in church and outside of the church building, is so important. This is why coming together, studying the word of God is essential because the enemy is trying to turn our hearts away from God. The enemy is patient, waiting for the opportunity to slowly turn our hearts away from God. And many are, are sitting right there, and I can see it. Oh, that ain't the case. Okay, let's do this. I want everybody here to, to think right now about something we're doing that we're not supposed to be doing. We've been warned against by God. We've heard sermons against that which we're thinking about right now. And uh, don't get all sanctimonious on me right now. Don't, don't do that. Saying, well, well, pastor, I, I don't have anything of the sorts in my life. What is that which you talk about? Because trust me, if that's your response, then the enemy already got you turned out. Lost and turned out. Olivia. But for all the rest of us who are of our right mind and ain't bought this fool's gold, look back at where and how it started. And I'm sure it was subtle, unassuming. And now it has or it's on its way to becoming a full-blown crippling idol in our life that is commanding our conscious and unconscious thought processes. That it is slowly turning our heart from God. It's, it's taking us away from regular worship. It's preventing the study of scripture in our life. It's causing disruption in the temple called our bodies. And it's isolating us from our brothers and sisters in Christ. <clears throat> Church, it's time for a shaking of the foundations of our lives. Because we're somehow the enemy got us souped up that it's not going to be a big deal. But slowly but surely it's happening. Slowly but surely we're falling away. Slowly but surely we're turning away. And, I, and I'm praying right now for, for, the, for the chains of sin, oppression to be broken. I'm praying right now for the shackles of, of pleasing others above pleasing God to be loosed. I'm praying right now for the tearing down of these idols 
temples that we have built for ourselves. I'm praying right now for the pulling down of strongholds in our lives that has us bound and we don't even know it and we're not even recognizing it. I'm praying right now for the destruction of these high places that we have created for this idol worship in our life. I'm praying right now for the strength to turn away, to walk away, to run away from that which is keeping us from being sold out to God. I'm praying right now that we come even closer together as a faith community. Let that iron sharpen iron that we start cutting away that which is destroying us individually and collectively and crippling this body of Christ. Church, our best life is not being lived on fool's gold. Our best life is not being lived, signing up for tests that God is not proctoring. Our best life is not being lived, allowing ourselves to be immersed in things that are negatively influencing us and turning our hearts away from God. And maybe, maybe you, you're that person that's saying, well, it ain't that bad. And I always like to use this for an analogy for people that think they're just strong enough to just be in situations and it's not going to affect them. You know, when uh, we, were, we were growing up, um, we had bunk beds. And I was often the top bunk. And it was what amazed me is the fact that... Um, even though I, I maybe was bigger than, than my brother, if he's standing on the floor and I'm in the bed and we grab hands and we pull, guess who's flying out of the top? Me. Because the thing is, I don't care how spiritual you think you are, how many years of life baptized front and back in the name of Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and everything else, if you are in the top bunk trying to pull somebody up, it's just not going to work. God ain't designed us to save anyone. And we're pulling and we're pulling and we're pulling and all of a sudden we're on the floor with them thinking, how did I, how did I get here? Like, man, I wasn't. I wasn't even in the drugs until I met this person. I didn't do this. I didn't do that. Then all of a sudden, I'm missing church. I'm missing the faith. You know, I see the pastor and start ducking and I need to get back in church. What we allow ourselves to be surrounded with. Snatching us out the top bunk. So it's really time to let go and let God. Mm -hmm. So let us pray.